Good morning, the wonderful world of technology. It's nice to be able to continue services. COVID has not been the best friend this week, but overall, I'm uh, beginning to feel better, hoping to be able to get outside a little bit and enjoy the, the cooler weather. But as we come here today, this morning, this special fifth Sunday, where we have a little more praise and worship and hopefully a little shorter message, but it's what God has provided for us. So if you would join me in prayer, most loving and kind and merciful God, we thank you for your presence, for your absolute love for us, for the rain that we so desperately need. We do ask for your inspiration on this service. We thank you for your presence here. Guide the words uh, that they are yours and that we can hear what you have for us. In Christ's name, amen. The title of today's message is, Who Does Jesus See When He Looks at Me? So pose that question of yourself, who does Jesus see when he looks at you? And, you know, I, I want to give you the image, and it should be on the screen, of a large mass crowd. Uh, we've all probably experienced being in a large uh, mass uh, crowded situation. And for some, that can be very scary. For others, uh, it doesn't, it's not a big deal. For others, it's maybe a place to hide in plain sight, but hide. So as you know, we think about Jesus in his love for us, what does he see when he sees each one, when he looks at you? Jesus sees you and he is more aware of your situation than even you are. He is fully versed in you. And as you look in that crowd, Imagine you're there and he can see each individual and he sees you in the midst of that. Today's text comes from Jesus speaking from a crowd. The reading today is from Luke 12, 13 through 21. But I want to go back to the beginning of chapter 12 in verse 1. It's kind of the, the background of where this begins. Luke 12 and verse 1. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another. You've experienced that or you've seen it on TV. Uh, I know every year we hear of people being trampled at a sporting event uh, that there's for whatever reason a mass exodus or there's a push and a shove to get somewhere. So there's this is. I want you to picture what this crowd maybe looked like. Thousands of people, and they're kind of pushing and trampling. And if you fall, that's not a good situation because it's hard to get up when everybody's trampling you down. So we think about this crowd and what it might look like. And for me, being in a crowd that is pushing and shoving and you know, maybe I'm I'm trying to make sure that my wife or my children, my grandkids are kept safe. They're not being trampled down. There's a lot of panic and pushing and shoving. Uh, and it can be very scary. You know, it's in interesting as I was thinking about this. I thought of an, an event in my life. I was a small child. I don't remember how old, but through the events of this story, uh, my memory, there's a lot of detail of we were at a wedding of my dad's cousin. And for some reason, we were in this hallway and it was just packed. And I was small enough that, you know, I was looking at people's belt buckle or, or down to their knees. I just was a very small child. And I can remember how scared I was that I was just in encompassed by people and there was no way out and hear this you know 60 plus years ago i remember those details i can close my eyes and still see the hallway and the people it, it's such an effect 
because of the scare. Fear as a way of clouding our thoughts and, and bringing in so many things uh, directly into our, our mind's eye. But, you know, the other part of this is you see this crowd coming. Can you pick Jesus out of the crowd? Would he have stood out? He wasn't distracted or thrown off by the crowd. So he obviously was was moving along and they were going going down and, and coming to uh, the, the point of the story. But he remains focused on his purpose and plan for you. That's a constant in this. But as you think about Jesus and this crowd, how do you picture the scene? Obviously, they're all on foot and they're walking. Do you picture the disciples walking around him much like we would see the secret service walking around a political leader? I mean, do you do you envision that? And I don't know what it looked like, but it that's to put it kind of in today's uh, scope. Jesus is not afraid of the crowd, and there is no panic or concern in his voice. And then in verse 13, someone in the crowd says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance for me. This is coming out of the clear blue sky. This is total random. And this person decided to take it on themselves to directly comment to Jesus and asking him to do something. Jesus had been speaking to the crowd about some pretty heavy issues. So the, the as they were walking along, as they were traveling, as Jesus was talking, he was sharing some pretty heavy things, like how to respond in the face of death, about not fearing those who want to kill you, but rather fear God who cares for you, about the consequences of denying the Lord and of his blasphemy. What to do when you're asked to defend yourself against rulers and authorities? These are pretty heavy and hard-hitting topics. And here's this man that decides to throw out his personal uh, thought or question, wanting Jesus to intervene in his family matter. Where does this come from? Where, where does he get off thinking that? And Jesus is constant. Through it all, he has a consistent and a resounding point. Do not fear and do not worry. God has not forgotten you, and he cares for you. So Jesus is staying constant. He hears the man, and he doesn't ignore the person. He engages the person, but he stays on topic. In today's, as, as people go by in a crowd, and a political fig figure or a sports person or an actor, people shout out questions all the time. And they, for the most part, just ignore it and go on. Jesus chose not to. He didn't ignore, but he engaged, but he stayed on his topic. In verse 14, and he said to him, friend, who sent me to be a judge and arbiter over you? First of all, he calls him friend. And in, in effect, that's all of us. We are his friend. He is our friend. And Jesus addresses him. And in, he also brings up the who sent me, the who question of Jesus. We've talked about that before. In this story, in this parable that is coming, who is Jesus? And where is he in your life? Where are you in this story? The who question. And that always is something as we read. Look and see where Jesus is, who Jesus is. Jesus does not become offended. He wants to help this man and us. So when Jesus addresses him as friend, what he's about to say to him is coming from a place of friendship. And if you have a really close friend, they're going to tell you things you may not want to hear. But what they perceive or what they say 
said for your good. And this is what Jesus is doing. He is speaking to him for his good, for the young, for the man that poses this question. When Jesus is speaking to us, he comes to us as our friend and the best friend we could possibly imagine. He never intends to harm. Even when he tells us something we don't want to hear, we know it's coming from he can be trusted. And that's even a close physical friend, human friend, you want to trust. And in most cases, close friendship is just that. This is even better. This is Jesus, and he can be trusted. It's always important to remember who he is in these stories. Jesus does not become offended. He wants to help this man and us. This man is focused on himself. He sees an opportunity to enlist Jesus to his cause. Do we approach Jesus as someone we can use to get what we want. You know, years ago, I told uh, one of my daughters when she was a child that Jesus wasn't like a credit card that you could put in your wallet, that when you needed him, he, you could just pull out this uh, card and take care of the situation. It doesn't work that way. He is with us all the time, and he loves us all the time. He is our friend. He comes back to the man in verse 15. Jesus said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And it comes down to he's telling a story, a parable. When we know who Jesus is, even when we don't have enough, we will have more than plenty. And never lose sight of that. Jesus always knows who we are, where we are, and what our needs are. And even if it feels like that we got shortchanged, we still have plenty. We have Jesus Christ. This verse talks about in 15, all kinds of greed. In reality, life is not about possessions. Jesus warns us all about all kinds of greed. Greed is wanting more, and we see it every day. It's in the news. It's even inside of us from time to time, and it shows out. And in fear, we will try to accumulate more and more in the hopes of securing our own life. This parable in verse 16 and 17 and 18, and I want you to listen to how many times you hear the word I or my. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. You know, it's interesting. It starts out with who produced the, pro the crops? The land provided. This rich ruler probably wasn't one of those out there being the farmer. And even that, the land is what produced. But he doesn't trust the land to produce next year. He wants what he has now. And the interesting question in verse 18 that comes to mind, why tear down good barns instead of just adding to them? Why not just add to the barns? but it's all about him. He doesn't want any memory or anything from his past. He wants to be this new flashy abundance uh, in everything that he has and what he does. So it's a matter of greed. He comes down to, and he's looking for ways to show off what he has. This is the rich man's hope. He wants to reach a point that he is completely self-sufficient. He wants to store up where he doesn't have to worry about anything. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him in verse 20, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself 
and is not rich toward God. This is the only recorded parable in the Gospels where God appears as one of the characters who speaks. And in verse 20, but God said to him. So so this is one that really we need to garner our attention to. The parable shows that the rich man has been foolish in thinking and living as he is the only one in the room. He has forgotten to listen to God. The man who wanted Jesus to settle a dispute wasn't listening either. Are we listening? Do you listen? The uh, rich man is unable to trust his future to anyone but himself. He is unable to receive what God richly provides. Jesus sees me as a child of God. He sees you as a child of God. And it doesn't matter if you're in a room by yourself or if you're in a densely populated crowd. He sees each one as his children, and he can tell you exactly what you need in that situation. He sees me completely and knows my heart. We see Jesus as our rich provider who loves us more than we can imagine. And he has provided everything we need. And today we have the opportunity to experience his provision of providing for us communion, the Lord's Supper. In his love for us, Jesus has given himself to us. We have the Lord's Supper and communion. Jesus gave his broken body in the bread. He also gave his shed blood in the fruit of the vine. And we are told to remember. You would uh, join me. Loving God, we praise you and thank you for these elements, for what they represent, the very body and blood of Jesus Christ that he willingly gave to us, provided for us, that we might remember him, who he is in us, who we are in him. God, what a blessing these elements are, and I just pray that you would bless them for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The elements are in front. The table is set. Please come as you are led.